So um, let's say that the child's overall cognitive ability is average. So your bottle is a, is a 100. And then your academic achievement is how much uh, fluid is in your bottle. And say if, you, if the fluid in your bottle was um, a, a standard score of 70, then you're obviously not uh, meeting your overall potential. And that's where the, um, um, historically, that's what we would uh, describe as a, um, uh, a learning disorder. Now the DSM-5 made it, I feel, a little bit more ambiguous. Um, in order to, um, from a clinical pers uh, perspective, um, allow for more um, learning disorder diagnoses to be um, diagnosed. So in the DSM-5, there's a single overarching category of specific learning disability with specifiers for current manifestations. So the DSM-5 specifies a specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. We call that dyslexia. That, uh, dyslexia would just be the neurological term that we use for um, deficits in reading. So it's um, there's many different portions of the brain that account for our ability to read. Um, so we call that, the neurological term would be dyslexia. Um, dyslexia, historically speaking, is um, when people think that their child or children are mixing up B's and D's, reading backward, those kinds of things. There's many different manifestations of what we would call dyslexia. So those are just very um, slight uh, potential manifestations of, of what we call dyslexia. So that's the neurological term that we would um, describe as a specific learning disorder in reading. And there's this uh, specific learning disorder mathematics, we call that dyscalculia. And then there's specific learning disorder in written expression. We call that dysgraphia. The DSM-5 eliminated the IQ uh, academic achievement discrepancy, kind of like I was talking about with the normal curve. So you no longer have to have that um, uh, clinically significant discrepancy between overall cognitive ability and your academic, uh, uh, overall academic achievement at that point. So um, uh, there doesn't have to be two standard deviations between your overall ability to learn and your overall academic achievement up to that point. So that um, example that I gave um, of a child having an overall IQ of 100 and then having an overall academic achievement score of 70, you no longer have to have that criteria. Um, replace that in the DSM-5 with um, a child who has learning difficulties that persist for more than six months. Um, the low academic achievement causes clinically significant uh, impairment. So um, children have difficulty at school, difficulty you know, domestically, that kind of thing with their reading difficulty, math difficulty. Um, the age of, on age of onset um, for these learning difficulties has to be in the school age years, uh, man, uh, may manifest fully later in, in life because um, a child may be able to understand, may have phonemic awareness, uh, the building blocks of, of reading, they may be able to uh, kind of compensate and be able to memorize sight words, um, but then it may manifest fully later because their ability to comprehend what they've been able to uh, learn through memorizing um, phonemes, memorizing sight words, then becomes a, a major problem when they're trying to comprehend what they're reading, which uh, um, requires um, what we call cognitive set shifting or multitasking. And then also, um, which I feel is very important in the DSM-5, these um, learning disabilities, learning disorders cannot be attributable, uh, attributable to intellectual disorders, developmental disorders. So if a child has an IQ below 70 and their actual academic achievement is say uh, below 70 as well, um, their reading difficulty would be better explained for, be, ex be better explained by an intellectual disorder. So if their actual cognitive potential, cognitive ability, 
is less developed than 98 percent of kids their age and their academic achievement is less developed than 98 percent of kids their age it's not a reading disorder so it's not a math disorder it's not a writing disorder it's an intellectual developmental disorder um other dsm-5 criteria um these aren't these uh, learning disorders aren't um, but are accounted for by sensory deficits, um, other mental or neurological uh, conditions, um, psychosocial adversity. So um, say um, not having access to uh, proper reading material um, for a long enough period of time, just not having exposure to reading material, mathematics material, so not enough time to be able to practice those things. Um, it can't be due to a lack of proficiency in the language of academic instruction. So if a child is, um, say, uh, English isn't their first language and they're being taught in English, um, we can't call that a learning disorder because um, we're teaching them in a different language. So there would need to be accommodations that are made to be able to um, account for um, their difficulties with learning. And it can be due to inadequate uh, uh, instruction. So um, they have to have access to um, a free and appropriate pro public education that's, uh, that's adequate. We'll talk about that in just uh, to maybe toward the end of the slide here, our presentation. So the DSM-5, when we talk about um, the overarching criteria of learning disorders, um, they explain um, learning disorders as being inaccurate or slow and effortful, uh, effortful we, uh, word reading, difficulty understanding the meaning of what is read, difficulties with spelling, difficulties with written expression, difficulties mastering number sense, number facts or calculation, and then difficulties with mathematical reasoning. So, um, so we kind of lumped all these together, but yet each of them is a separate entity. So reading, uh, reading disorder, um, specific learning disorder with impairment in reading, um, a specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics, and then specific learning disorder with impairment in written expression. Um, those are the types of learning disorders, even though, um, actually, let me see. Um, the DSM-5 just kind of lumps them all together. So let's talk about um, what we call dyslexia, um, like I was talking about before. Um, dyslexia or um, specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. And the DSM-5, we, uh, we talk about um, core deficits and word reading accuracy. So word reading accuracy being um, difficulties with um, the building blocks of, of reading, just the, the, the phonemes, the the sounds that individual letters make, the sounds that the building blocks of, of individual words make, and then the sight words that uh, go together to make phrases and sentences, and then uh, deficits in reading rate or fluency as we start to pick up on some of those uh, individual phonemes and um, individual words. We have to be able to read uh, read um, fluently and a rate has to be um, age appropriate. And then the next core deficit would be in reading comprehension after we get um, individual words down and then being able to read fluently. And then we have to also be able to comprehend what we're reading. So those are the core deficits in um, specific learning disorder with impairment reading. Dyscalculia, specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics, um, includes core deficits and number sense. So just not being able to pick up on um, um, uh, memorizing uh, basic numbers, memorizing arithmetic facts, um, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, not being able to understand how those are um, um, how those are um, conceptualized and, and how we do those. And then accurate or fluent calculation, 
um, kind of like I was talking about with memorization of arithmetic facts and then accurate math reasoning, kind of like in dyslexia or um, specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. Um, we have to be able to um, understand individual numbers and then we have to be able to memorize and accurately um, uh, do fluent calculation and basic arithmetic facts. And then we have to be able to take those basic arithmetic facts and then um, apply them to math reasoning, higher order math problem solving, which also in, includes um, um, the necessity to be able to read fluently and comprehend what we're reading, because we all know that um, when train A leaves at 7.30 and train C leaves at um, 8.30 and we have to um, be able to <clears throat> understand what they're going to be meeting in the middle, that obviously um, requires accurate um, um, reading comprehension skills as well. So accurate math reasoning being the, um, the next core deficits in dyscalculia. Dysgraphia, dysgraphia being a specific learning disorder with impairment in written expression, dysgraphia. Core deficits are in the efficiency of written expression. So being able to quickly and accurately um, uh, write basic letters, um, words, and phrases. Um, spelling accuracy is going to be um, deficient usually in core, as one of the core deficits in dysgraphia, spelling accuracy. Um, once again, uh, there's a large overlap in, in um, reading disorders and um, uh, math disorders and, um, and written expression disorders, obviously. And then um, next step, if we don't have those skills down, there's going to be difficulties with grammar and punctuation accuracy. Um, we see, uh, see that a lot these days. I feel like kids are working on computers a lot more and we're having a lot more difficulty with spelling, uh, grammar, punctuation. Um, uh, we could, uh, I feel like working on keyboards a lot more, um, having spell check, having um, some of these different programs that help us learn some of these grammar, punctuation, accuracy, spelling accuracy types of um, crutches uh, oftentimes lead to difficulties with children being able to figure out these um, things themselves, even though um, these types of accommodations, hopefully, if children are relying on them, um, should be able to help them. Um, dysgraphia also uh, would require um, uh, clarity or organization of written expression. So um, after we have efficiency in written expression, spelling accuracy, grammar and punctuation accuracy down, um, we'll also see uh, clarity of organization of written expression start to be a difficulty. Um, I feel like there's a large comorbidity here between um, this deficit in dysgraphia and um, organization of written expression because um, there's a high prevalence of um, ADHD, ADHD being an executive functioning difficulty. So ADHD, um, a lot, uh, you know, executive functioning difficulties being deficits in organization, planning, behavioral and emotional regulation, um, focused attention, sustained attention, um, inhibition, impulsivity. So a lot of times if, if children struggle with these things, their organization of written expression and clarity of written expression is going to be lacking because they have difficulties with planning, organization, and a lot of times impulsivity. So their um, organization and clarity of um, um, kind of higher order written um, material is going to be lacking as well. So the effects of learning disabilities. There's a lot of effects of learning disabilities. If a child has a learning disability, obviously um, there's going to be some internalizing and externalizing um, uh, deficits that we see or difficulties that we see. So 
three-fourths of children with a reading disorder in elementary school continue to have problems in high school and young adulthood. Um, I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about the um, different types of um, learning disorders that um, the most prevalent learning disorder is reading disorder, which is um, when it comes to learning disorders, um, about 80% of learning disorders are accounted for by reading disorders. So they're obviously the, the, uh, there's a significant um, uh, portion of reading dis uh, or learning disorders being reading disorders. So three fourths of children with a reading disorder in elementary school continue to have problems in high school and young adulthood. So SANS, um, accommodations, treatment, um, all the recommendations that we give. Given that specific learning disability with an impairment in reading, dyslexia is a neurological condition. There are certain parts of the brain that are um, not quite wired the way that they need to be in order for children to be accurate, fluent um, readers. This, this difficulty that we have with reading is going to oftentimes um, uh, continue into young adulthood and even uh, adulthood. Um, other effects of learning disabilities, I see this quite often when, when a child has a learning disability, they have a daily experience of being labeled, <clears throat> especially if we're accessing um, uh, resource room help, um, special education settings, and being unable to keep up can lead to internalizing and externalizing uh, behaviors, especially when we're not keeping up with our peers, our peers are noticing that we're not keeping up and um, say we're being pulled from our regular education setting. Um, it becomes a, a major issue with children with learning disabilities. So uh, comorbid behavior problems we see a lot in children, um, especially younger children. I see more internalizing problems clinically in, in children who have learning disabilities and, and um, in the later years, they become more anxious, maybe more depressed. Um, younger children have more um, externalizing problems, behavior problems, um, and uh, it's actually three times higher for them to have externalizing problems. Comorbid problems include ADHD. Um, um, research shows that about one third of children with learning disabilities have ADHD. So, um, and that's kind of a, a double-edged sword um, because a child with ADHD is gonna have difficulty focusing on what's um, being taught. So they have difficulty learning because they're not paying attention. And then when they're having difficulties with learning, they start to not pay attention even more because they're not able to keep up. So this becomes a, this becomes a major problem. We also uh, see a lot more externalizing um, fight, flight, or freeze types of responses. And a lot of times we see more of the fight type of response in children with learning disabilities. Um, so disruptive mood conditions um, can, can oftentimes um, be more prevalent in, in younger children and then oppositionality. So if a teacher is trying to teach a child with learning disabilities how to uh, read, um, um, uh, correctly um, do math, write, uh, you name it, um, they're going to start to be oppositional because their full-time job is to go to school. They go to school eight hours a day. And uh, oftentimes I give this example, half of my job as a neuropsychologist is writing reports. Now, um, I, I kind of uh, metaphorically s speak about having a learning disability as, um, uh, maybe having instead of 10 fingers, having only, you know, a couple fingers in each hand. So a child who um, has difficulty with, lear uh, with learning is going to be on a keyboard, for, like, like for me, typing reports, it's going to take three times longer, and it's going to lead um, to grumpiness, um, becoming um, more moody, more behavioral more oppositional. So it's just um, kind of comes with, with the territory. It's almost expected. 
So here's a nice graph that shows that um, uh, behavior problems are much more prevalent in, in children with learning disabilities, especially as children grow older. Behavior problems among children with learning disabilities is, um, um, is about 30% um, as, they, as they grow older, especially by the age of eight when we're in um, you know, first, second, third grade. Um, and we're expected to do work that I feel is much more um, difficult than what it was 20 to 30 years ago um, for reasons I'll explain right now. There have been some prevention efforts um, to help children with learning disabilities. <clears throat> learning disabilities or disabilities uh, that are covered under the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Um, two of the main um, um, the, the two main things that we consider under IDEA, uh, Individuals with Dis uh, Disabilities Education Act is um, children want to be, we want to keep children in the least restrictive environment. So if they have uh, what we call individualized education plans and um, or 504 plans that outline the accommodations that they're supposed to be receiving on a daily basis for say like learning disabilities, behavioral dysregulation, emotional types of conditions. We want them in the least restrictive environment. We don't want them in the resource room 80% of the time when, um, when their uh, abilities and their skills are actually um, potentially allowing them to be in the regular education class 50% of the time. So we have to keep an eye on that to make sure they're in the least restrictive environment and they're in, um, um, they're in a, setting with their with their neurotypically developing uh, peers um, as much as possible and also another um, uh, the main um, goal of IDEA is for every child to have a free and appropriate public education so LRE and FAPE. There's been some prevention efforts to help children um, um, not be left behind um, there's a No Child Left Behind Act that was signed into legislation in 2002, um, which was replaced in 2015 um, with the ESSE. Um, this led to more state standardized testing to hopefully allow children to be recognized and receive more supports. Um, state standardized testing, I feel like led to a lot of difficulties I won't get into it too much. Um, state standardized testing, I don't wanna get into uh, too much. I have quite a bit to say, uh, say about that in the No Child Left Behind Act, but um, uh, we have a new act now, 2015 ESSE, that has been uh, much more accommodating, I feel, for children with special needs. Um, other prevention efforts are the response to intervention uh, movement, which is a th uh, three-tiered program for support it was developed, um, I helped develop uh, that in 2008, um, but that was around the time, 2006, 7, 8, when the response to intervention movement was starting to um, uh, gain ground in America. Um, it's a three-tiered program, kind of like a pyramid. If a child is struggling with, say, reading, math, writing, um, they would be pulled out in the bottom of the pyramid. Um, to get small group support at the end of the class, maybe in the back of the classroom for 10 minutes. If that wasn't helping them um, improve, then they would have access to the resource room to get more uh, support. And if they weren't improving after that, then they would be, um, they would get individual, individualized testing to see if they had a learning disability. And if they did, then they would receive support through say like an IEP or 504 plan. Um, um, this hasn't been all that well received because it takes a long time to identify children who have learning dis uh, disabilities and it's almost kind of like a wait to fail model 
um, where children um, are put in all these different settings and may take an extra year to recognize that they have a learning disability and that could that year um, six months year whatever it takes could it, it's very pivotal to be able to put into accommodations right away that are necessary for them to be able to um, succeed as much as possible given their learning um, challenges So let's talk about the accommodations and treatment strategies that we have for each of these um, uh, difficulties. So dyslexia, um, the most important um, strategies that we have are early intervention. We want to be able to recognize um, learning difficulties in, in reading as, as quickly as possible. Um, so we wanna focus on phonological processing, um, which is identifying initial words, um, being able to memorize individual um, letters, um, phonemic awareness, so the small chunks of, of, of words, um, say, you know, the A-N letters make this type of sound, um, phonological memory, same kind of thing. So um, being aware of individual letters, being in, uh, aware of individual um, letter blends, being able to memorize that and then um, being able to pronounce those. And then alphabetic principles and phonological recoding. So um, all of those kinds of strategies are very integral uh, in, in early intervention strategies and um, uh, being able to do those things in say preschool, um, I'd say preschool is probably the most important time to be able to do those things before children get to kindergarten, because by the time they get to kindergarten, these types of skills are, are usually already expected. Um, after that, sometime, after we, 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 we work on um, recognizing and memorizing individual letters, individual sounds, um, we, we move on to other types of strategies uh, that focus on word level reading. So. Uh, sound boxes, when we're talking about phonological processing, phonological memory, um, a lot of times some of the interventions that we have are um, using just individual uh, boxes of letters so that kids aren't focusing on a whole page of words and they're just kind of focusing on sound boxes of um, individual letter blends, um, word boxes, so they're focusing on um, individual words and then sound sorts, kind of the, the same as um, phonological processing for say, the, what does the AN um, blend say? And then what does, um, uh, well, how about let's go with this. What does the AAD um, sound blend say? And then what does the AM sound blend say? And then, um, putting those together and you get the word Adam. Um, and then there's the copy cover check um, where children are copying um, individual words, uh, usually short words, and then we're covering up what we, what we wrote and then making sure that, that we wrote the, the, correct, um, the correct words. And then repeated readings, which I feel are, are very important for memorization strategies um, because if, if we're repeating, um, you know, individual lines, uh, paragraphs of, of reading material and doing that multiple times, kids are getting more um, rehearsal for what they're reading and um, they're able to hopefully generalize what they're learning from those, um, from those things that they're, they're reading repeatedly to other um, reading material. As children start to um, develop some of those building blocks, <clears throat> excuse me, of learning, um, and they, they start to um, mature, some of the other uh, accommodations and treatment strategies that we have for dyslexia, access to recorded materials, so allowing children to increase their vocabulary and fund of knowledge of words, and then being able to apply that to the words that they see on paper is important. 
very much uh, like the access to compensatory system strategies, um, technology, sprint, uh, uh, print to spree, uh, speech software, um, and then obviously um, allowing additional time on reading tasks is very important as well. Like I was talking about before, we need uh, increased opportunities to rehearse. So um, oftentimes children are given IEPs, individualized education plans, and they're struggling with reading, math, written expression, learning disorders, plus we have um, some type of behavioral struggle. A lot of times if we have the combination of those two things going on, then we get an individualized education plan, which is a, a parent caregiver um, school collaboration to see if a child um, requires an IEP. Um, other types of rehearsal types of opportunities, reading more at home with caregivers, parents. And then um, I always say that I'm kind of long, uh, going along with the lines of repeated reading strategies, re reading preferred subjects is important too. Um, I always recommend this to parents for kids who have reading difficulties. Um, reading things like um, if a child has a circumscribed interest in say tractors or trains or Minecraft, Roblox, let them read all they want. Um, they, there's books now that are um, graphic novels, I think kids call them, which are basically just <clears throat> large uh, cartoon sections of, um, of papers that we used to read as children. Um, they're in a novel form now. Um, if children want to read those things to get more um, uh, familiar with, with reading strategies in general, uh, you know, go right ahead. Um, getting them more rehearsal types of opportunities is extremely important. And then when it comes to reading comprehension, we get all these things in place um, for younger children, um, reading um, accuracy, um, reading fluency, then we move on to reading comprehension. So we want to make sure that they're able to comprehend what they're reading as well. So some of the um, some of the questions that we want to hear, uh, ask them here, who, what, when, where, why, you know, make up different questions about what they're reading because we don't want them just focusing when they've had a lot of difficulty with um, reading accuracy, reading fluency. Um, we want to make sure they're also comprehending, comprehending, seeing the forest for the trees. They're not just focusing on accuracy because that's what they've been focusing on for the past three years to make sure that their accuracy and fluency is up to, up to par. We also want to make sure that they're starting to comprehend the reading as well. <clears throat> Specific learning disorders um, with uh, uh, impairment to mathematics, dyscalculia. Um, once again, it's important, uh, essential to practice uh, rehearsal. Um, and um, there's many different strategies. They're, they're, they're very similar to reading strategies. So we want to rehearse early um, numeracy and math operation facts, being able to just memorize um, uh, individual numbers and things like uh, addition, subtraction, um, multiplication, um, uh, division, we have to be able to, to memorize all those things. Um, cover, copy, and compare, just like I said in um, dyslexia. Um, taped problems, so um, um, we have, <clears throat> we put, say, um, problems on tape, and then we want the children to be able to um, um, recognize those and it's kind of like a cover copy and paste cover copy and compare I should say and be able to go back and forth so that they're able to recognize if they're making um, uh, making um, errors in what they're um, learning and being able to um, uh, fix those errors and then there's interspersal strategies so interspersal so um, that would be you know if a child is doing pretty well on say addition, um, but they're having difficulty with subtraction, um, interspersing things that they're very good at with things that they may struggle with. So having um, addition and subtraction problems on the same page, having six uh, addition problems that they're very good at, and then having one subtraction problem that they may struggle with. 
um, being able to kind of help with um, confidence as they're learning some of these strategies and then explicit timing strategies, which I feel <clears throat> um, are being used, but they're also um, helping um, helping quote unquote children become more accurate, but being more efficient and timing children to become more efficient, which I feel like also contributes to impulsivity. Um, so, but there's also explicit timing strategies that are involved in um, helping children how to learn um, um, mathematical operations. Finally, with the dyscalculia, there's visual representation. So um, allowing for charts, maps, graphs, um, um, things like multiplication tables. If a child is having difficulty with, say, multiplication tables, then um, they need that rehearsal to be able to see that visual, spatial, tangible object to <clears throat> um, perform, say, their multiplication until they're able to get a better handle on it. It's kind of a um, a common sense type of approach, um, but visual representation, having visual spatials to help them with mathematics is very important. So um, um, once again, a rehearsal strategy. Peer assisted learning, being able to work with peers is very helpful. Um, if a peer is having more, less struggles with, with learning, they can help their um, uh, other children with, with learning dis, uh, disabilities especially considering that the school system is, um, I feel very under-resourced. There's, um, uh, there's not enough, there's not enough teachers and, and paraprofessionals to be able to go around to help all the children with learning disorders, considering that learning disorders are much more prevalent than, than we would expect. Um, even up to uh, 18, seven to 18% of children have a, have, a, have a reading disorder. So it's very difficult for children or parents or not parents, but teachers and parents to be able to get around to all of those um, uh, different children who have uh, special needs. And then self-instruction. So um, this is kind of a metacognition type of a strategy for children to um, think about how they're thinking, um, writing down all the steps in, in, um, in, uh, in their math problem solving. This is kind of like the, the higher order math where we're teaching children how to um, use these other um, approaches and accommodations that we've taught them up to this point and um, apply those themselves through self, themselves through self-instruction. Accommodations and treatment strategies for uh, specific learning disorder with impairment and um, written expression dysgraphia. Oftentimes an occupational therapy evaluation is important. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into assessing um, um, difficulties with written expression. My wife being an occupational therapist, we were just talking last night that <clears throat> um, motor coordination, motor strength. Um, it involves basically the whole body. Um, when she's teaching a child how to um, how to write, they even work on uh, core strength, um, ab strength, because when we're when we're writing, we're using our whole body. Um, so it, it requires core strength, and um, not only that but also teaching fine motor coordination difficulties um, gross motor coordination difficulties and um, those are very important to address first and these are very much more common than you would expect dysgraphia difficulties with written expression are much more common than you might expect in in in, in young children i see them quite frequently in children under the age of say eight um, other accommodations include um, pencil grips. So we've all probably seen, um, I even have uh, a pen here that has a, a larger grip on it. It just kind of helps us be able to <clears throat> um, control our pencil because uh, when we have fine motor coordination difficulties, we, we often see children with say like tripod grips and having difficulty just coordinating that very small 
the pencil that they're trying to, um, that they're being asked to write with. There's slant boards. Um, when we're writing, we notice that um, as adults, we're writing in a straight line, but that requires a straight wrist. It requires a straight elbow. Um, so in teaching children how to write, um, one of the strategies is slant boards because this is a much more <clears throat> um, smooth motion for children. So uh, sometimes we use slant boards to help them. Um, there's also raised paper, raised line paper. So we have lines on the paper that we write with, um, but we, we there's certain raised line paper where the lines are <clears throat> raised and children are able to um, follow along those lines to be able to um, um, write in a straight line. There's highlighted paper. So kind of the same thing as children start to uh, develop some of these strategies, highlighted paper to help them go along on a straight line. And there's obviously graphic organizers as well. As, as children go uh, grow older, we um, organize our um, uh, planners and those kinds of things graphically um, using say like highlighters and that kind of stuff to help them be able to um, um, write out, plan, organize what they need to be um, um, writing out. There's also multi-sensory techniques. So um, in, in early, ch uh, early childhood development of um, writing and written expression, multi-sensory techniques, things like the Orton-Gillingham approach, <clears throat> um, we use multi-sensory techniques. Um, some of the examples would be <clears throat> having a child um, write their name and say like a sand uh, uh, board that has sand on it. So they're using multiple senses to be able to write. They're seeing the sand, they're feeling the sand, um, they're smelling the sand. So they're using much more of their brain to be able to, um, to write so that um, they're um, generalizing what they've learned through their, their um, multi-sensory techniques to be able to apply that to actually writing on a piece of paper. Um, there's assistive technologies. <clears throat> there's even pens that you can use as um, that, that kind of help us that are, that are larger, that are, um, that are um, um, better equipped to help children who have sensory deficits that require them to be able to, to, to write that are very much like the things that we use like slant boards and raised, um, raised lines. As children get older, they're gonna need extended time. Um, extended time, they may need um, handouts, printouts of things that are, um, that they're being asked to write down during class because they're not able to write down as quickly. Um, they may need teacher made outlines for taking notes. Um, once again, same kind of thing. And then access to speech to text or dictation software. So if they're not able to keep up and not able to write as quickly, so like dragging dictation software, they're able to <clears throat> take notes um, verbally. And that's kind of an accommodation or a, um, a treatment strategy for them to be able to keep up without having to keep up through written expression. Um, another thing that I always recommend is supplementing writing with an oral report or explanation. Um, I use the example, you know, a child may be able to read a book um, very fluently and know all about the book, and then they have a writing difficulty and they're asked to write um, a page about what they read, a book report, and they hand in two sentences because they have difficulty with writing. Well, they can tell you all about the book, they should get an A, um, but if they uh, uh, are graded just on what they wrote, they're obviously going to fail. So um, oftentimes supplementing written expression with an oral report or explanation of what um, um, tasks are is going to be very helpful. And then keyboarding and typing instruction uh, also is very helpful because um, I feel that's kind of the way um, children are going to be uh, learning, especially now when we're talking about COVID and uh, most 
um, teaching is done on keyboards. Keyboard and typing instruction is um, a way for children to be able to kind of circumvent any type of um, writing difficulty, difficulty that they have. They still need to be right, be able to write fluently, but they also um, may be able to um, teach us what they know through keyboarding and typing, um, typing up what they know. There are at times children who appear to be struggling and parents who are pulled aside by a teacher and uh, an indication that the child is. One of the things that was apparent during the conversation was the addressing of disruptive behaviors that are sometimes co-occurring with learning disorders. And I've had the opportunity to work with kiddos who have had challenges and the anxiety that they feel when they are taking turns reading out loud in the classroom and it's a paragraph at a time. And so they would have they would have this challenge and they would start counting ahead which paragraph is going yeah. to be theirs and start reading that. And then everything else that is said, it, all of the rest of the reading is lost on them because they're so focused on rehearsing that <clears throat> paragraph that they're responsible for. Um, and other kiddos who have had those challenges and who haven't done that rehearsal um, or figure out you know, which one is going to be theirs, they actually be ha they have disruptive behavior at that time. So it becomes an avoidance of having to actually perform the task. And so those have been challenges to like pinpoint when those behaviors, um, what is the antecedent to the behaviors and further assess some of those pieces. Do you have any guidance or screeners or any kinds of things that could be done in the primary care setting to help do that antecedent kind of flow or screener work? Yes, so um, in the schools, we do you know functional behavioral assessments. <clears throat> so we look at antecedents and consequences of behavior. Um, in the primary care setting, is that what you're talking about? <clears throat> primary care, primary care setting. Um, it's very important to to talk to parents about their child potentially having difficulties with learning, and um maybe even just asking for daily behavior report cards we don't want to push the schools too hard um but we want to be able to like you said um identify the antecedents and the consequences of the behaviors that we're having um without saying that we need an applied behavior analysis or functional behavioral assessment at school because that's going to be very difficult for uh, the school to be able to say that we need to do those kinds of things because the resources may not be there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as a primary primary care, care um, setting, um, it's important to talk about any, chi any child who has learning difficulties, um, attention difficulties, um, and when the behaviors are occurring so that we can talk about talk about reducing the antecedents and reducing the consequences of a, a potential behavior to be able to identify the behavior when it's occurring <clears throat> and then um, helping with um, identifying what the, what the behavior actually is and why the behavior is occurring, if that makes sense. Yep, thank you for that. And then there was a comment um, and somebody had messaged me and there is a student that has been working with OT within the school system, has all of the deficits that you have listed and appears to be receiving accommodations at the school for dysgraphia. Um, yeah. But the parents have never been given a diagnosis of dysgraphia. And so is it, is it necessary? Is it, is it important to have an official diagnosis? Um, <laughs> on paper or in some kind of fashion to have an official diagnosis that would maybe qualify them for additional services or can you speak to that at all? Absolutely. Um, it'd be easy to just call um, a therapy organization and say that a child is having difficulty with written expression. Um, oftentimes occupational therapists can't just write off and say that they need occupational therapy. They would need to also document that a child is having difficulties with act activities of daily living. That's what occupational therapists look at primarily um, and, and treat and are able to um, um, bill for. 
Right. But they, so, they can also work on written expression, you know, because if a child is struggling with written expression, then it's their occupation to be able to write um, at school. So they're not meeting their, uh, their their activities of daily living because they're not able to um, um, do all the things that they need to be able to do at school. So um, at that point, um, a, a school wouldn't give a isn't able to give diagnoses like dysgraphia, ADHD, those kinds of things, um, because those are psychiatric disorders. Um, so those would need to come from a, a, um, an actual, um, say like uh, occupational therapist, um, psychologist, those kinds of things. So it need to be more of a, um, um, an actual uh, clinical setting. So an occupational therapist within the school setting cannot give a formal diagnosis? Nope. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. And if a child isn't um, um, meeting, if they're not improving enough at school, then it's time for um, clinical services. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? I'm gonna add just one more comment to that, Dr. Bosick, I think. Um, in, in the experience of having a diagnosis, um, sometimes to be able to continue to receive services at school and to have either it be on an IEP or a section 504 and to have those services be covered, sometimes it becomes necessary to have the diagnosis in those formal programs at school to have yep. the services be able to be received at school. Is that really the only, maybe the necessary piece of having to have that done at school, do you think? Um, maybe not necessary, but I find that a lot of children who, who, who get services at school, say like occupational therapy or speech language pathology, um, those services at school a lot of times aren't quite as comprehensive. Um, so um, they may graduate out of those services earlier than say um, would, than say they would at, at, uh, at, at a clinical setting. Um, okay. The clinical is much more thorough, so they would be able to uh, address those concerns much more thoroughly and, um, and get more services that are much more intense and much more potentially um, um, helpful. Very good. All right. <clears throat> Are there any other, we're just a tad over our time. So if there are any other questions, please um, shout out now. Um, while you're thinking about what you might have left to ask, I just wanna make sure that everybody please remembers to do the post-test and evaluation following this uh, presentation. A uh, reminder also that um, the CME requirement is to be turned back in within three days with a roster specifically from the UND, which I think is offline right now. Um, that we are in need of those things in order for CME credits to be given. So thank you all very much for attending today and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the, what is it, the first week, first Thursday of March, which seems too quickly coming. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay. At least so the warm weather is coming. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, take care, everyone. Wonderful to see you and have you present with us today. Thank you.